This story is dedicated to Arianwen Melona. Puer, Head of Anuivin Retold by Hugh Carr Long ago, in the island of the mighty, there lived a young ruler named Puer. He was lord of the seven contrevs, that is, seven hundred homesteads of David in what is now southwestern Wales. He loved his land and his people, and governed well. Yet what he loved best, maybe, was hunting. So one day he rode out from his court at Darbeth on his best horse with his favourite hounds and made for the forested valley of Glynkich, where he let his hounds loose in the woods. In time, he heard a great baying and smiled to himself, confident that his clever hounds had found the wildest stag for him to pursue. Following the sounds, he pressed through the twisting trees until he came to a clearing in a narrow pass. Yet he did not find his hounds there. No. Instead, he found another pack of hounds. But what? hounds. They were so white that their sides shone with a light like the stars, and the red of their fine ears was so bright they turned the glade crimson all about them. Never before had he seen hounds so wondrous. They had brought down a beautiful stag. Overcoming his wonder, Puich went among them and turned them off the body of the stag. His own hounds were skulking back from the shining ones, so he called them to him and baited them upon the fallen body of the beast. Thereupon, a lone rider came into the clearing. He was dressed entirely in grey from head to foot, and he rode upon a dapple grey charger as beautiful as the shining hounds. Proud was its head, and strength was in every strike of its fine hooves. Then the rider spoke to Puish, and said with a deep voice that seemed to come from all around, You have done me wrong, sir, and though I know your name, I will not now use it because of your discourtesy. Puish suspected at once what the stranger meant, but he still asked, What discourtesy have I done you, noble sir? Never have I been so slighted as by your action today, replied the stranger gravely, that a noble man should drive my hounds from their prize and give it instead to his own. Between me and the gods of my tribe, Puish replied, I am ashamed that I have treated you so badly, Lord. Tell me a way that I may make amends to you, and if it is in my power, I will not rest until I have done it. The stranger pulled down his riding mask and revealed his face. His skin was as white as the snow, and his brows were blacker than the raven's wing. His eyes were a striking blue, like a winter ice pool. Puish had never seen a more handsome face in mortal men. He began to suspect that this noble man was not so. Even as he thought this, the man said, I am a Rowan, king of Anuivin. Anuivin, thought Puish, the other world? What have I done? All his life he had heard tales of the other world. That land that lies over our own and under it too, and is blended with it. We might seek it all our lives and never find it, or, not knowing what dangers lie within it, we may wander blind in our ignorance and into an unknown wood, and, when a strange mist falls down upon us, find ourselves there in all its perilous beauty. 
Rowan, king of Anuivin, spoke on. You have sworn by the gods to make amends. So you shall, and so earn my friendship. This is then the charge I lay upon you. You shall go to my court in Anuivin. There you shall rule in my place for one year. On the last day of that year, you shall ride out to the ford, which is the end of my realm. There you will meet the man who wages ceaseless war upon me, Havkan. He also claims the kinship of Anuivin. You shall fight him in my place. If you live, you will have my friendship. Lord, said Purr, I will do this. But will your people not wonder where their lord has gone? And if I am to stand in your place, will they not reject me? At this, Aron raised his right hand in which he held a staff of elder. He pointed it high above Pulch's head and then swept it down towards the ground. As Aron did this, Pulch felt an itching in his skin. He dropped the reins and brought his hands to his face, which felt flushed with heat. Rowan smiled a crafty smile, but it was no longer a Rowan. As Puich looked, he saw the man upon the dapple grey horse now had his own image. Yes, Rowan said, my people will obey you now when they look to you and see my face. None in my court will know you are not I. None, but perhaps one. Puish sought to ask who this one may be, but Aron spoke again. When the day comes to fight Havkan, you must be sure to strike him one blow only. If you succeed in knocking him from his horse, he will beg you to finish him with a killing blow. This you must not do, however much he pleads. The ways of the other world are not your ways. Do as I bid, and if you survive, we will meet again in a year and a day. Go now. I will let you find your way to my court. Without word, Puil's horse moved below him and at once began to trot down a narrow track between the trees. Overhead, the branches weaved together until they formed a roof of wood, and all Puich could hear was a muffled thud, thud, thud of his horse's hooves on the thick turf. A long time they rode on this path, until it grew dark within the wood. Puich had all his life hunted in the woods of Daved, and knew all the sounds of every bird and beast, but the calls that came out of the dark between the trees were strange and sinister to him, so he turned his head straight on and focused on the path ahead. In time, they emerged out onto a rising slope as the sun sank low on the horizon behind him. Its walls were rendered in smooth white, so as it caught the light of the setting sun, the castle shone like a candle flame. About it, the night seemed a cloak of true purple, and the stars were as flawless diamonds upon a cushion of velvet. Poet rode to the open gate. Once inside, he was met by handsome lads dressed in rich silver grey. As Aron had said they would, they greeted him as if they had always known him. They saw to his horse and to his needs, cleansing him of the dust of the road and dressing him in garments of the finest gold brocade. Everywhere he looked, he found the richest of furnishings and appointments. The floor beneath his velvet shoes was of painted polished tiles, smooth and cool, and the walls were hung with tapestries that were so intricate the scenes sewn upon them seemed almost to move. When the time came to feast, he was led by Aron's courtiers, whose conversation was as bright 
great and noble as was their matchless garments and weapons, to the great hall, which was filled with marvellous light. On the long tables were cups and vessels of pure red gold. They sparkled in the light, more beautiful than any gold he had ever before beheld. Yet there was greater beauty to come. Red gold, too was the hair of the lady who came to sit at his side. She was tall and slender, long of neck and unequalled in grace. When he looked upon her face, Poish knew he had never seen a more beautiful woman. His heart ached, yet when she spoke, he learned at once there was greater beauty than the eyes can hold. Her voice was an enchantment. All through that feast he listened to her words. Never had he known one more wise, more insightful, and more gracious than she. When the time of feasting came to an end, and those gathered desired more to carouse than to weave words, the lady at his side touched his hand and drew him to their bedchamber. More than anything in the world, he longed to lie with her and know her embrace. But he knew, too, that Arwan had made this so. She was Arwan's queen. He knew then that though death may well await him at the end of the year, there were greater trials to face here and now. So when they lay down in the bed, as soft as owlets down, he turned his back to her, the loveliest woman in the world, and did not touch her. Every night his longing for her grew, and every night she seemed more beautiful still. Every night he drew up his courage in bed and turned his back to her. So... A long and painful year passed. Yet in all that time, Puich found that there was nothing in the court of King Oron that was not the most splendid he had ever known. Each plate was adorned with jewels. Each member of his court was noble-faced, fair of speech, and unmatched in care and courtesy. Each hunt and feast and jest were greater than the last. It was with heavy heart that Puch rose on the last day, knowing it must all now come to an end. It was the queen who came and dressed him in Aron's armor. The metal was as bright as ice, and it shone. When she had finished, she raised her lovely face and said, When you are victorious at the end of this day, let it be my husband who finds me waiting for him in our bed. Puch flushed at this. Had she known all along, of all the court of Rowan, she indeed seemed the one who would know him truly. Though I have not been as a husband should be to you, I hope that tonight you will have everything that you have longed for again. As Puch set out from the court of Rowan, there rode at his side a mighty company. Each was arrayed in the costliest of armor, and every plate shone like silver on a fair day under a blue sky. Banners of deep blue and scarlet and silver gray streamed out from spear tips, held high in the wind. They rode to the reaches of Aron's lands until they came to a ford in a stream. There they were met by an opposing company, each dressed in armor that gleamed like matchless gold. Two came to meet Puer. One was the Herald of Havgan, the other was Havgan himself. Whereas Oron and his people were all beautiful to look upon so that they transcended the form of mortals, Havgan had a form of mightiness unlike any that Puch had ever before faced. His golden armor seemed as impenetrable as a castle wall. 
Puish remembered what Aron had said, that if he managed to unseat Havgan with one blow, he must not strike another, even if Havgan begged him to do so. But now that he saw him, he almost laughed to himself. Havgan seemed as sure in his saddle as if he and his horse were both carved out of one piece of rock. Nobles, listen well to me, cried the herald of Havgan. This battle is between two and two alone. Each has claim on the kingdom of Anuivin, and so they must settle this dispute alone. Let all others recognize their right to single combat and aid them not. Puish and Havgan took their place at an equal distance on either side of the stream. Puish looked at his mighty opponent. He felt like a twig set against an ancient oak, powerful withstanding all the storms of the world with drinking roots wound deep into the earth. How could he overcome such a thing? Still, it was his doom. He had sworn to absolve himself of the dishonor he had brought upon himself. One did not bite the thumb in the face of the lords of the other world and not expect to be deeply bitten back. He spurned his horse and began to race towards the river and face his foe. Havganstein charged towards him. Its eyes were alight with the wild fires of Anuivin. How would he knock Havgan from such a beast? His eyes darted back and forth over Havgan's form as he thundered closer. Was there a weak spot in his armor? No, Havgan held his shield stronger and more true than any mortal. And then he saw the lance of Havgan tilt and rise, pointing straight at Puel's eyes. Havgan did not mean to unhorse him. He meant to pierce through Puel's helm and kill him outright. He felt a sudden itching in his skin. The other world king was almost upon him. All hope was lost. As he thought so, the itching became a hot burning, and then he felt his body seemed to shrink down within his armor. He was turning again into his own shape. At that very moment, the lance of Havgan struck. Yet it had meant to strike at the tall shape of Aron, and instead it glanced off the peak of the helm that now housed the shorter Puish. His own lance, poised to strike Havgan mid-shield, now slipped down and breached below, catching Havgan in his belly and unseating him fully from his charger. Over the cheating rear of his horse, he hurdled and fell with a crash to the ground. Huish slipped off of his saddle and came to Havgan's fallen side. Quick, the mighty man said, his voice shaking. Take your sword and kill me now. Strike me another blow and finish what you have begun. Remembering the words of Aroan, Puesh did not do what he was bidden. Seeing him hesitate, Afghan cried out to him a second time. I am suffering. End my life. Take up your sword and finish me. I have made no claim against you. By what right do you now allow me to suffer so? Do me this one boon and take my life swiftly. By these words, Puish knew that Havgan saw him truly as himself and not her own. Yet he did not rise to draw out his sword. Havgan's next words were cried out in a desperate tone. By all fears and all loves, by the bright skies overhead, by the lips of the lady you love best, set me free. End my life. These words pulled deeply at Puish's heart. 
He did not wish to see a king so needlessly suffer, but he was sworn to a Rorn not to do this deed, and so sworn his oath held him fast. At last, Havgan's face darkened, and he said in a bitter, defeated voice, So be it. Then he called out to his followers, My people, I am broken, and will not now rise again. The summer sun has finally set in me. My death is now certain. I can no longer maintain you. Let my people and the people of our own, the true king of Anuivin, be as one. Knights came then and lifted Havgan from the bank of the river and carried his body away. Those assembled like shadows melted away. Puich returned to his horse, turned his back on the road to Aron's castle, and began to pick his way on the wooded path to Glyn Keech. At last he came to the place where the stag and the white hounds had been, and found the man in grey, Aron, awaiting him with arms held wide. He embraced Puich and said, the gods have rewarded you and I, and made our friendship fast. You have united my kingdom under one rule, and when you return to your lands, you will find what I have done for you in turn. So when Puer came again to his halls at Arbeth, he went straight to his steward and asked him to gather all the chief courtiers and advisers of his court. How would you say my rule has been in the last year? Speak to me truly now, for I want to know all my faults and how I have failed in my rule. The steward, courtiers and advisers talked among themselves and then answered him saying, Lord, none here can think of a single thing you have done that was not wise, just and merciful. Never have you been more perceptive and fair in judgment. Never more free with gift-giving. Never have you brought such prosperity to your people or you such discernment. We, your people, have grown in the past year to know there is no greater ruler in all the island of the mighty. Between me and our gods, it was not I who made it so, said Puish. And he told them all what had befallen him after the hunting of the stag in Glen Keech. But I will not fail you now, he said, when they had learned the truth. And as a warn has ruled, so shall I forever on from this day. And it was so. When the Rorn returned to his court in Anuivin, he went straight to his bedchamber to see his wife. When they went to bed, he lay and caressed her lovingly. When he spoke to her, she answered him not. A second time he caressed her and called her loving names, and she replied not. He rose in bed and asked of her a third time, Why will you not speak with me, your husband? Lord, said she, this our bed has known no speech for a year, neither the pleasure of your touch nor even the sight of your face, as your back was ever turned to me until in the morning you would arise. Between me and the gods, Aron said half to himself, what a faithful comrade is poor. So it was from that time that the friendship between Aron and Puish was increased. Each sent the other hounds and horses and whatever beautiful treasure he thought the other would value. And because of both Puish's valor in defeating Havgan and uniting Anuivin and the ever-growing prosperity of both realms through the example of Aron, Puish came to be known as Puish, head of Anuivin, ever after, even unto this day. 
Here ends this part of the tale. When next we meet, I will tell you the day that Puish sat upon the mystical mound of Gorseth Arbeth, and how he beheld the coming of the goddess Rhiannon. Puish and Rhiannon from the ancient tales of the Mabinogion, retold by Hugh Carr. Puish, lord of the seven contraves of Doved, was feasting with his nobles at his chief court in Arbeth. Ever since he had found friendship with Aron, the king of Anuivin, the other world. He and his people had lived in bliss. But there was one thing that Puish lacked. He had no love to share his blessed life with. For one year, he had been changed into the likeness of Aron, and slept every night by the side of Aron's wife, the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. Her face and her grace haunted him still. After the feast, Puish went out for a walk with his nobles, and their steps brought them up the rise of the mound that is called Gorseth Arbeth. As they climbed, one of the nobles said, Lord, this mound has a very strange legend about it. Do you know of it? No, answered Puish. Tell me of it, friend. Well continued the nobleman. I have heard that if someone of royal blood, such as yourself, sits and waits at the top of the mound, one of two mysteries will happen. Either they will receive wounds from invisible hands, or they will see a wondrous marvel. Puish paused for a moment and thought. He had faced such strangeness before, when he had fought Havgan in the realm of Anuivin. He wondered then, whether Gorseth Arbeth was another place where the other world came close to our own. Between me and the gods of our tribe, Puish said confidently, I will risk this marvel. Come, let us take our place upon the top of the mound and see whether we are worth wounds or a wonder. They made their way to the summit of the mound, where they could see the castle of Arbeth and the lands all about it. Puish looked to the ancient road that ran past the base of the mound that the Romans had made in long forgotten days past. Then, along that very way, he saw a great grey horse approaching. Upon the horse he beheld a woman in shining gold brocade. Although her dress was more striking than anything he had ever seen before, even in the court of Aron. It was nothing compared to the wonder of the woman who wore it. Her yellow hair streamed out as she rode so that it looked like a ray of sunlight was about her head. For a moment, Puir was struck dumb. Then he cried out to his men, By all loves, tell me who that lady is. Alas, we do not know, my lord, his followers replied. Straight away, Puish sent one of his men to ride to her and hail her, but by the time he reached the Roman road, the lady had ridden past the mound. The rider galloped after her as quickly as he could, but all who watched could see that however fast he rode, she always stayed the same distance ahead and could not be reached. When he had exhausted his horse, the man returned sorrowfully to Puish's side. This was a wondrous marvel indeed, Lord, said one of Puish's friends. But Puish only stared out for a long time in the direction where the lady had gone and said not a word. No longer was his thoughts full of the face of Aron's queen. He had seen with his living eyes a woman who was more beautiful still. The next day they feasted as before, but Puish was restless in his seat. 
and did not seem to enjoy himself. When he was asked what troubled him, he said, I do not want to be here. I want to be on the top of Gorsel the Abbath. Perhaps the lady can even now be seen riding on the old road, and I will miss her. Would that I was there. Then let us go there, Lord, said one of his friends. Before they set out, Puil went to the best of his riders, giving to him the fastest horse in the kingdom. They travelled up the winding path to the summit of Gorseth Abbath, and came to sit where they had done so the day before. The moment they turned to look at the ancient road, they saw again at once the beautiful lady on her noble horse, seemingly travelling at the same gentle pace. Quick! Puel called to his fastest rider. Race to her now, and ask her to come to me. Immediately, the lad leapt into his saddle, but already she had passed the mound, where only a moment before she had been seen approaching it. Puel and his people watched as the lad made his way as quickly as he could to the road. But even though the lady never seemed to break beyond a gentle canter, the lad on his horse, which they could see was galloping for all it was worth, never even drew close to her. In the end, the fastest rider in the kingdom had been vanquished by the woman, and he had to return to Puel's side. Do not be angry with yourself, Puel said to the rider. It is clear that no one has the power to catch her. Surely she is one of the people of the other world. Yet half to himself, he said, yet between me and our gods, she had some reason to come here. A curse be upon my head if I do not find out the reason. That night, Puel could not sleep. He kept pacing to his window in the dark to look out upon Gorseth Abbath, silver and grey under the moon and stars. In the morning he would not eat. So passed his day in which his people could not enthuse him or distract him from constantly desiring to look in the direction of the mound and the ancient road. At last, one of Puel's friends came to him and said, It is clear, Lord, that you will never be content until you solve the mystery of the beautiful lady and the mound. Let us waste no more time here. Come, we will go with a small company and the best of horses together. If you do not see her again, perhaps you will receive blows instead that will be worthy of the unhappy look that is on your face. The moment they set foot on the top of the mound, they again saw the lady in gold upon the same horse and setting the same gentle pace. Puel leapt at once into the saddle and set out. No sooner had he done this than she was passed where the path met the road. Down to the Roman way he drove his horse until he saw the lady ahead of him. He gave his horse the prick of his spurs and set it at once to a spirited gallop, thinking that he may catch her. His horse's hooves thundered beneath him, and the horse's breath was loud in his ears. Though he rode so that the horse was almost spent, still he drew no closer to her. All efforts seemed fruitless. In despair, he cried out, Lady, for the sake of he who you love best, please stop and speak with me. As soon as he had cried out these words, the lady reined her horse and awaited him to catch up with her. When he reached her, he saw there was a wry smile on her pretty face. Gladly I will, she said with a laugh. It would have been better for your horse if you had called to me sooner. Poeth looked on her fully and saw that she truly was one of the people of the other world. Like Goron, who he had first met in Glyn Keith, her beauty was far beyond the form of mortals. Under the brightness of her eyes and the power of her smile, he found it hard to gaze upon her 
for long without blushing. Where do you come from, lady? He asked, and where are you going? I have come from my father's house, and I have come to see you. Three times I have done so, and only now you come to speak to me. Puer's heart lifted at the thought she wanted to see him, but he was equally abashed that he had not ridden after her in the first place. I see now I was a fool for it, but by my heart I will be a fool no longer. Tell me now, if you have come to seek me, who you are and what I might do for you. The lady held her head high and said, I am Rhiannon, daughter of Hevaith the Old. In my father's realm I have been content, until I saw you riding with King Noron. When I saw you and learned of the deeds you did in freeing him from his never-ceasing battle with Havgan, I knew I had looked on the man I could love best. By all the gods I am glad to hear it, said Puer, beaming. Rhiannon held up her slender hand to silence him. Do not rejoice yet. Against my will, I am being given to another man who I do not love. I have never wanted a husband until the day I saw you. It was then I knew what I wanted. If you will come before my father, though, and show your alliance with Aron, king of Anuivin, then I am sure he will let me have what I want. Lady Rhiannon, I want nothing more than to ride to your court now. No, Rhiannon said determinately. There are reparations to be made if I refuse the man who has asked for me. I will prepare a great feast in the right season a year from today. Come then with the greatest of your warriors and those of Aron's court and claim me then. Then you will take me to bed that night and you shall be my king. That is, if you want me, Puel said. If I had the choice of all the women in the world, there is none I would choose who is your equal. I choose you. Good, Rhiannon laughed delightedly. Before she gave her horse his head, she told him how to find the court of Hevaeth the Old, her father. Do not forsake me, she cautioned. Keep your promise. I will, Puel assured her, and returned to the castle of Arbeth wearing a wide smile. How could any man not want to keep such a promise? He asked himself. A year of anticipation passed, and Puish set out with a colorful company of nobles and warriors from his court, accompanied by many of the mighty of the court of Aron, one hundred in total. They were in high spirits as they rode through the day and arrived at the court of Hephaeth the Old in the early evening. There was great rejoicing as the mighty households joined together in feasting. Rhiannon wore a dress that magnified her beauty. Her hair was a perfect cascade of gold, and her eyes were as bright as the leaves of a spring oak. Puel sat at her side, laughing with Rhiannon, hardly ever breaking his eyes from her. As the night drew on, the need to take her to bed pounded inside of him. He begged leave of her father to take her from the hall so that they may join together and be bonded in love as man and wife. Take her with you now and leave this hall as my son, said the great voice of Hervéeth. As Puel rose and took Rhiannon's hand to lead her away, a voice called out from among the feasting guests. Puel tore his eyes from Rhiannon to see a tall youth dressed in fine silk. Come, friend, he said. Why do you stand where there is fine wine and food fit for all? Sit and take your fill as our guest. I cannot, said the lad, his face half hidden in a hood. For I am here as a suppliant in need. I cannot sit nor leave until my errand is fulfilled. 
by his fine voice, Puth knew this lad was of noble blood, and it pained him to know that any noble household had fallen on hard times. Then, friend, you will ask of me what you need, and I will gladly give it and fulfill your errand. And you said you would never again be a fool, Rhiannon said to Puth in disgust. Do you know who you were speaking to? Shocked, Puth could not find words to reply. But the youth said, Lady, all the nobles gathered here heard him say he would fulfill my errand. With a dry mouth, Puth turned to face the lad again. What is it that you ask of me then? You are about to sleep tonight with the woman I love best, the lad said, and lowered his hood to reveal his face. He smiled wryly and said, I ask for her and for the preparations of this feast, which should have been mine in the first place. Puer fell silent. Now you have remembered how to keep your mouth closed, said Rhiannon. You best keep it so, before you give my father away too. This lad is Gwaul, son of Clid, who I was being given to against my will. You are beautiful to look at, Puer, but I never guessed you could be so dull-witted. How was I to know? Puth began, but again his voice failed him. Rhiannon took his hands in hers. Even though you are a dullard, my love, I still love only you. Don't say anything more. You have promised in front of my father and all the nobles, and you must give what you have promised. With her cool hands in his, Puth began to shake as a rage came upon him. How can I? I would rather die than see you with someone you do not love. I shall... I... I will... I... I... He stammered and reached for his sword. No! Rhiannon admonished him. That is not the way. She turned then to Gwaul and said, Please, give me one moment to say farewell to Puer. If I am to be yours, I must shut off my love for this man. Give me but a moment to speak with him. Gwaul nodded his agreement, and Rhiannon took Puer to the far corner of the great hall, still with one hand in his. The other she placed upon a wooden chest, which she opened. She drew out a small leather bag and pressed it into Puer's hands. Then she bent close to his cheek and whispered in his ear, this is what I want you to do. Come now, called out Gwaul, when he saw Rhiannon giving Puer a final kiss. I have been patient enough. By the customs of our people, no suppliant can be turned away at a feast. How long am I to be kept waiting? It is high time that I receive an answer to my request. Rhiannon returned to her father's side and said, As I am no longer to sleep with Puth tonight, it is not his place to give anything that is not his, and this feast was given for the people he brought. It is not right that it should be taken from them, but I will make you another feast, greater than this, and after that you will sleep with me, and I shall be yours and you. Mine. Tell me when this is to be, said Gwaul eagerly. A year from tonight, Rhiannon answered, and all the nobles agreed upon it. Gwaul set out for his kingdom, and Puil returned with sadness to David. A year later, Gwaul and his retinue returned, and he sat at Rhiannon's side as Puil had done. If Rhiannon did not love him, she put on a good show of it. And when the feast was high, Guau was merry with the wine, and the thought that soon he would be in bed with Rhiannon, the most beautiful woman in the world. The minstrels had paused for the time when it was traditional for suppliants to come and ask requests of the nobles. Before Guau and Rhiannon came, a shabby band, dressed in all but rags. One came forward from among them and asked to have his request heard. 
By the gods of my tribe, said Gual, raising his cup high so that wine splashed from the rim. You are welcome. What do you want of me? Great lord, said the beggarly man, I am a suppliant, and I ask for your mercy upon me and my friends. What is your request, friend? asked Gual. And if it is reasonable, I swear before the nobles here that I will grant it. It is reasonable indeed, said the beggar, and held up a little bag. All I ask is enough food from your table to fill up this bag. Such a modest request, Gual said, and motioned servants to bring food to the beggar. You will have all you can hold in the bag. Food was brought on golden plates, and the beggar opened up the little bag to take the food. Yet, however much was put in, the bag did not seem to stretch, or indeed to be filled. Plate after plate was emptied into the bag with no sign of the bag overflowing, until Gual stood up and said, Enough of this! You have had enough! But Lord, you said I can have all I can hold in the bag, the beggar reminded him. Will it ever be full? Gual asked, incensed. Lord, there is only one way for this bag to be filled, the beggar said, and it is this. If a strong, brave, and mighty nobleman presses the food down with both feet and commands, this is enough. Rhiannon stood and said to Gual, Champion, only you are fit for such a task as the most noble man here. Truly, said Gual. He came and stood before the beggar, who placed the bag down on the ground and opened it as widely as he could so that Goal could lift his feet and place them into the bag. The moment he was standing in the bag and began to cry out in a loud voice, This is enough! The beggar suddenly lifted the bag so it was over Goal's head, and he was head over heels inside. The beggar closed it and knotted it tight, then wrenched off his hood to reveal... Pueh! Uwish put a hunting horn to his lips and blow. The other men threw off their rags and uncovered their armor and weapons beneath. And a hundred others of Puish's and Oron's soldiers came into the hall, taking prisoner of Guau's men. The warriors of Puish who stood by him each took a turn to kick at the bag. Hoi, what's in here? said one, smiling. Ah! There is nothing but a badger, another said. The company found this so funny that it all began to play at beating the badger who struggled in the bag, and so the game of Badger in the Bag was first played. Lord, came a muffled voice from within the bag. This is no dignified end for me to die tied up in a bag. What will you swear to to be freed from this death? Puil asked. The man in the bag was silent for a time, and then he said, Whatever you ask of me, Lord, that is in my power, I will give it, if you will free me. Then I ask you to give up your claim on Rhiannon. She does not love you, and no woman should be with a man she does not love. Do you agree? Puil said. You speak truly said the man in the bag. I give up my claim on her and will never again seek to take a woman who does not love me. Ask that he take no revenge either, said Hrianon to Puish, for you know he will be furious that you have tricked him even as he tricked you. And so, like men, you will both go on forever taking revenge for the revenge that someone did because of the revenge, and so on until the end of the world. They made Goal swear to never take revenge against Puish or Rhiannon or any of their people, either personally or through the action of any other. Then Goal was released from the bag, and he arose, covered in bruises and food. And even though he had suffered a great humiliation, he was true to his word. Goal's men were permitted to leave unharmed, 
and the feast struck up again with renewed vigor, as all were agreed that they had never seen a feast that was its like. And when the time of feasting came to an end, Puil at last took Rhiannon to her chamber, where they spent the night and the following day in pleasure and delight. Here ends the tale of Puir and Rhiannon. Next time, I will tell you the story of the birth of their son and the mysterious abduction that followed after. Rhiannon and Pradere From the Ancient Tales of the Mabinogion Retold by Hugh Carr After the marriage of Puil and Rhiannon, the kingdom of Dafed lived in bliss. There was no want and lack, the harvests were richer than ever before and no one visited the king and the queen without going away the better for it, either with a costly gift or all their needs and cares addressed. However wise Puil had been after his time in the kingdom of Anuivin, it was doubly so with Rhiannon at his side. Every day was greater than the last, and the people came to know that justice, benevolence and virtue could be found in their mortal lands beyond the other world. And however much the land grew in abundance as every day passed, it was as nothing to the love that continued to grow between Puil and Rhiannon, his goddess and wife. But even with all this joy, there were some who can never be content. For two years, the people were satisfied. Yet when a third year passed, and Rhiannon showed no sign of producing an heir to the kingdom, the nobles of the land came to Puil and expressed their concern. Lord, they said, by the gods of our tribe, we have known no greater reign than that of yours and of your wife, the Lady Rhiannon. Yet there is no child to give us confidence that your reign will not fail and this blessed time come to an end. Is she not able to bring you a child to ease our cares? It is still early, and we are both young, replied Puil. Do not be afraid. Give us another year, and you will see an heir. We must, cautioned his nobles, for without one we cannot permit this union to continue. Put your trust in me, as I do in your wisdom, and I will not fail you, Puil replied openly. Yet, in his heart, he said, I will never give Rhiannon up. There is nothing she could do that would make me betray my love for her. As it was, they were treated to long days of matchless weather. The sun was bright and nights clear with bejeweled stars, so there was no shortage of their lovemaking in that time. And so it came to be that before the year was out, Rhiannon began to show signs that she was with child. In the spring of the next year, she gave birth in our birth to a handsome boy whose hair was as golden as Rhiannon's. When the night came, it was dark and thick with mist. No star could be seen, and no one went to or fro once the sun had set, for fear they would become lost. It was the night of May Eve, one of the nights of the year that the other world is close to our own mortal lands. The elders of the realm whispered that it was a mixed blessing that the child should be born at such a portentous time. 
Rhiannon, happy but tired, lay herself down to sleep in her chamber, and her young son was left to the care of six nursemaids. Outside, the darkness grew. It crept inside the stronghold of Arbeth like a living thing, swallowing the light. Neglecting their charge, the nursemaids fell into a deep sleep as a thick, dark mist entered the room and wrapped about them. It was shortly before sunrise that one of the nursemaids woke and, fearful that she had fallen asleep, turned to where they had left the boy. Her stomach seemed to turn to ice within her as she found the baby missing. In a panic, she woke the others, who began a frantic search for the child. Though they sought him high and low, they found no sign of him. We shall be blamed, moaned one of the nursemaids, and then we shall be killed. We shall be let off lightly if they only kill us, said another sorrowfully. Rhiannon is a wise and just lady, said a third. There is hope. She will be merciful. You are a fool to think so, said the first. There is no hope. Even if she showed us mercy, the whole of the kingdom will be against us. They will demand justice. Think what they will believe we have done. Murdered and destroyed an innocent baby. But what if it could be proven that it was not us? said the eldest among them. What do you mean? they asked. Thinking quickly, the woman said, There is a deer hound in the stables that has newborn pups. If we take one of the pups and destroy it, and then smear its blood on the bedclothes and Rhiannon's hands and face, and then we will say that she attacked us and... and destroyed her own child. Despite the vileness of the deed, they could think of no better plan. Although all of them had seen the mercy and justice of Rhiannon and Puich in judgment a thousand times, none of them were brave enough to bet their own lives on it. And so one of them snuck into the stable and stole the poor defenceless pup and brought it back to the bedchamber of Rhiannon with a broken neck. Then they set about rending it apart and carefully smearing the blood about Rhiannon's sleeping form. Rhiannon slept long and deeply after the labour of birthing her boy. When she awoke, she found herself clammy and besmirched by something sticky. Straight away she rose in bed and saw the nursemaids cowering about her. And then she saw the horror that was upon her hands and clothes. Where is my son? She asked with a growing fear in her heart. The nursemaids began to tremble even more before one of them stepped forward to say, My lady, we tried. We tried so hard to preserve him. But you were too strong for us. We did not know what to do. What do you mean? Rhiannon cried. Oh, for your love of me, tell me now where my son is. Good lady, we can hardly think that you would ask us. When all that is left of him is still upon you. Rhiannon looked down on the blood upon her hands and her clothes and that splattered around the bed. Then she looked back to the nursemaids. With all her strength, she said, as calmly as she could, I will ask you one more time where my son is. I see you are frightened of something, or perhaps you fear punishment. If you tell me the truth, I will do all that is in my power to protect you. But if you lie, I will not aid you. Your one hope is in being truthful to me. Think on this, and then answer where my son is. 
You took him from us, said the nursemaid who had concocted the lie. We all six tried to fight you off, but you had the strength of ten armed men. We are bruised and battered from the effort of trying to restrain you. And when you took him, you... you... you tore him apart and ate him. What has come upon you that you should say such a horrible lie? Rhiannon asked. I care not if you blame me falsely as you do. Only tell me truly, where is my son? What have you done with him? Though she spoke fairly to them, reasoned to them, and begged and pleaded with them, they would not turn from their story. When Puith came to the chamber to be with his wife and young child, and found the room in ruin, and the nursemaids all hysterical with the story of what Rhiannon had done, all the colour went from his face. He looked upon his wife, and though the women all accused her, he would not believe them. But where was his son? He too searched for the day, but could find neither any sign of him or anything that could disprove the horrible rumour that Rhiannon had done the unthinkable. With no other evidence, he was duty-bound to let the nobles of the court know of the claims of the nursemaids. Who knew the bliss of the kingdom would be paid for by so high a price? said one of the nobles. Yet we should have expected this. Is the Lady Rhiannon not of the other world? Is she not, therefore, an enchantress and weaver of dark magic? We have never asked of ourselves from whence this magic comes. Now we see it is through the blood of the innocent. This and many more accusations came from some of them, for there are always those who, when they are met with the unknown, allow their own dark fears to replace their judgment. Heated words were thrown about until the nobles called that Rhiannon should be cast out of the land. At last, Puich arose and called the assembly to be quiet. There is nothing that Rhiannon could do that would make me separate from her, especially now, when she has lost so much. I do not, nor will I ever believe that she has done such a vile deed. Yet I cannot prove her innocence either other than to ask that you trust in the word of a lady that you have seen be just and merciful in these past years. Poet was silent for a moment, hoping that someone would now speak on Rhiannon's behalf. To Poet's sorrow, no one came forward. At last, Poet said, Very well. You believe beyond all the evidence of her character that she has done this terrible thing. Though she and I rule this land, we are as subject to its laws as are the lowest among us. So, if it is true that she has done wrong, let her be punished for the crime. The wisest of the court gathered together and discussed the matter. They could find no fault with the testimony of the six nursemaids, nor could they find anything to prove Rhiannon's innocence. So it was decided that for seven years Rhiannon should sit by the gate of Arbeth while the sun was up and tell her story to everyone who might not know it. They added too that she must, after completing the tale, get 
down onto her hands and knees and offered to carry into the court on her back any guest or stranger who would allow her to do so. When she was strong enough again to begin her punishment, she took her daily place by the gate. It was seldom that anyone would allow her to suffer the punishment of getting on her back and her being there, horse, into the court. In the land of Gwentus Coed at that time, there lived a brave and noble lord by the name of Ternon. In his stables were the finest horses in all of the world, and among them was his handsome and prized mare. Every May Eve she foaled, but even so, that same night a great dark mist would descend on the Cantrev. When it lifted, there would be no trace of the beautiful foal. As the night of May Eve came, Tenon said to his wife, Between me and the gods of our tribe, we will be fools if we are now another year to pass without discovering who or what it is that robs us of our coat. I will sit up tonight with my weapons in the stable and guard the mare as she falls. Tenon took his sword, his spear, and his long shield, and he sat within touching distance of the mare. Before the night was half past, she foaled a magnificent sturdy coat, flawless and beautiful. Tiernan put down his weapons for a moment to stroke the little beast and marvel at the way it stood proud and strong. But the moment he laid down his sword, the great mist that had gathered outside rolled into the stable and turned all within to utter darkness. Tiernon heard a sound of something large and heavy outside, and then the scream of the young coat. He snatched up his blade and sought to find the foal. Instead, to his horror, he found a great, thick arm like a tree trunk, and the colt seized by a mighty clawed hand. Tenon hacked at the arm until it was severed at the elbow. The hand and forearm fell into the stable, and the foal was released as a giant scream bellowed outside. With spear and shield in hand, Tenon raced outside but could see nothing but for the thick, dark mist. In the darkness nearby, he heard the shambling of a great form, and for a moment he purposed to run after it. But then he remembered the unguarded foal and turned back to the stable. When he entered, he found not only the foal and the mare safe in the room, but a small, golden-headed child, wrapped in cloths of the finest silk. In a wonder, he gathered up the child and brought him to his wife, where she lay sleeping. She awoke then, and saw the amazement in his face, and that he carried a burden in his arms. Did you save the fall? she asked. Not only that he said, and told her of what had befallen there with the mist and the strange thing in the darkness. His wife looked at the silk brocade and said, He is the child of noble people. What should we do? asked Tiernan. I will take some women into my confidence and ask them to say that I have been with child. In time, we will show him to the world and call him our son. A good thing that, said Tenon. What shall you call him? His wife looked at the hair upon the boy's head that was more golden than the corn. I will name him for his hair. Goury golden hair he shall be called. So 
Guri Golden Hair was brought up in their court as their son. And before a year had passed, he could walk and run better than a three-year-old child. Before the next year had passed, he was as strong and witty as the best child of six years. And by the time he was four, he was as skillful a rider as a grown man of twenty, and arguing with his father why he could not go out with him on their patrols of the land. Because Guri was already a great rider, his father had given him the fine colt who had been rescued on the night they had found him. The two were inseparable. The horse responded to Guri's every command without a word from him, as if the two were of one mind. Ternon and his wife loved Guri deeply. And though they often wondered as to the strange way he had come to them, they never let that stop them treating him as if he were truly their own. Yet one day, the news reached them both of Rhiannon's shame and grief. Tenon sent out trusted men to learn more, and they brought to him the news that Rhiannon claimed her innocence. And they learned, too, that the disappearance of Rhiannon's golden-haired baby was on the very same night that Guri came to them. They knew at once what had to be done. It is not right that a woman should suffer such grief and disgrace when we hold the source of her innocence from her, said his wife sadly. You are right, replied Ternon. But in setting the wrong to rights, we will lose our son, who we have not passed a day not cherishing and calling our own. But it is as you say, however much we will hurt, the Lady Rhiannon's hurt and loss is greater, for she has not had the joy of loving him as we have. They set out for Arbeth with Guri at their side, riding the horse that had been with him since the day of his birth. All the while they rode there, Ternon and his wife tried to hide their grief from Guri, but they knew that they would lose him. When they reached the court of Arbeth, they were greeted by the beautiful Rhiannon at the gates, sitting by the mounting block. She stopped them from going further and began to tell her tale. Chieftain, she said to Ternon, let me carry you upon my back into the court. This is my punishment that I must endure for killing my own son. Seeing the noble face of Rhiannon and how she bore the punishment so bravely, Ternon was more certain than ever that it was right to free her from her suffering. He came to her side and asked her to cease in her story. Then he signaled for Guri to dismount and join them. Lady, look upon this boy, Tiernan said softly. Look upon his face and tell me there is a father and son who do not look more alike than he and poor. Look upon his hair and yours, and say there is not two colours more alike. Lady, look upon your son. Rhiannon cried out and threw her arms about Guri. All there cried and laughed with her, to see the great weight of her sorrows and anxiety lifted from her shoulders. Oh! The sight of him has washed away the worry, she said. For not a day has passed that I haven't worried that he was out there somewhere and that I could never find him. We had named him Guri Goldenhair, said Tiernan's wife. But it is a mother's right to name her child, and you have named him. In his absence you knew nothing but anxiety, so let that be his name. 
And so, in that moment, Guri was given the name of Prideri, and he was known so forever afterwards to the end of his days. And because he would go on to do great deeds, so his name was known long after the day he finally fell. But of that dark day, this story does not tell. Puith had been away on a circuit of the land, and he returned with his men to the court. The first thing he saw was that Rhiannon was not at the gate. He feared that some new misfortune had come upon her and him. He ran straight away into the court and found instead Rhiannon with Ternon and many nobles rejoicing. Then it was that Prideri was brought before him. Puith looked upon his face and recognized him at once. He lifted up the boy in his embrace and laughed, fit to burst, until tears broke from his eyes at the remembrance of all Rhiannon had suffered, and he beside her. How can we ever repay you for uniting us with our son? Poeth asked Ternon and his wife. Only that he should never forget us. Ternon's wife answered, holding back her tears. You shall have more than that, Puith said. He stood with Rhiannon for a time and talked to her. When they were agreed, Puith and Rhiannon rejoined them. Rhiannon and I lost a son for a time, Puith said, but also so have you. You have raised him well, and he has grown knowing only you and loving you. Therefore, he should not have to choose between us. We shall be as one family, our two lands. He will live with us for part of the year, and with you another. And we will always protect your land and support you. And when Prideri comes of age and the kingdom of David is his, he will support you and your heirs forever. A great feast was called that night, and all the nobles of the court were gathered together again, for the first time since the hardship of Rhiannon began. For although many had accused her, few had been able to come again and look in her face as she sat at the front of the court, and they felt in time a great shame that they had been so ready to believe the testimony of the nursemaids against her. As to the nursemaids themselves, Rhiannon had them brought before her. Not all had survived. Some were too torn by the guilt of their deeds, and so had perished, racked with their guilt. Those that did come before her were prepared for death. Rhiannon looked upon them and said, You have been punished enough. From this day on, each of you will be maintained until the end of your days by my household. For though you were unjust to me, you have not changed me into being equally unjust. I am the same as I was the day you testified falsely against me. All those assembled were amazed that Rhiannon was so compassionate and forgiving. But there were none that felt it more deeply than the women. And though they never served her directly again, they were faithful to her to the end of their days, treating others from then on with the same kindness and justice that Rhiannon had shown them. From that day on, too, Rhiannon and Puith at last lived in happiness, and their days of love and life together were long, but not everlasting. Prideri grew to be a handsome lad, and there was not a skill that he was considered the most accomplished at. When the day came at last 
for Puer to leave his life. He gave the kingdom to Politeri and died in happiness, knowing that there was no better man than Prideri to keep the realm in bliss. Prideri ruled the seven countries of David and increased their prosperity, and he was beloved of all the people in the country far and wide. In time, he conquered the three countries of Ustrad Tui and the four of Caradigion. With this new kingdom in his command, he married the fair Kigva, daughter of Gwyn the Splendid, son of Glowy, son of the ruler Kasna, one of the greatest rulers in the Island of the Mighty. Here ends the first branch of the Mabinogion. Please help the channel by pushing the like button and leaving a comment. I'll write back to you. Don't forget to subscribe and push the notification bell. If you feel you're able to support my work, please consider pushing the thanks button. Just push this button and tip what you like. Everything helps. Above all, please share, share, share with your friends.